So our next speaker is going to be Drew, and he's going to cover um, transport in the Boltzmann transport equation framework. Go ahead, Drew. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the theory and the methods behind some of our transport calculations, implementations, and electron phonon scattering within perturbo. Uh, okay, so let me start with the basics first. Uh, previously, our group has successfully been able to compute accurate phonon limited transport properties for a very broad class of materials. And we have also been successful in understanding the dominant scattering mechanisms. So to quote a few examples, uh, one of our primary works was uh, calculations of mobilities uh, in semiconductors such as gallium arsenide. Uh, we have recently extended the scope of our transport studies to include magnetic fields as uh, evidenced in this middle plot. And also, uh, our code is capable of computing thermal transport properties such as thermal conductivities and Seebeck coefficients uh, as shown in this rightmost plot. So uh, overall, our code is capable of computing uh, electrical transport that includes conductivities and mobilities, a magneto transport that includes magneto resistances, all mobilities and all factors, and thermal transport that includes Seebeck coefficient and thermal conductivities. So the key equation uh, behind all of these calculations is the Boltzmann transport equation, or BTE, as I'll be calling it from now. And uh, BTE is basically a statement about the conservation of the number of particles. So uh, the key quantity here is F and K. F represents the electronic occupation that changes with time. And it's labeled by two indices, N stands for band index, K stands for the electronic momentum. And uh, this BT or the Boltzmann equation is uh, describes the time evolution of these occupation factors. And from them, we can extract transport quantities. And there are several terms which are involved in this. So on the left side, uh, we have DFDT, which represents the explicit time evolution of the electronic occupations. Then we have the time evolution of the occupation that comes from drift terms due to external fields or thermal gradients. And then on the right side, we have the changes in occupation that uh, are characterized by scattering processes. And there can be various scattering or collision processes inside any crystal, such as electron phonon scattering, which is going to be the main focus of this work. And uh, it because it dominates at high temperatures. Uh, additionally, there can also be electron defect scattering or electron electron scattering which is more important at low temperatures and for correlated systems. So let's uh, try to solve the Boltzmann transport equation. We can explicitly uh, simplify some of the terms in the BTE. First of all, we can set this term, leftmost term to zero because the electronic occupations don't implicitly have a time dependence and they only depend on time to the external fields. So in steady state, this term is zero. Then the next two term represents the change in electronic occupations due to uniform temperature gradients and uniform fields. So that includes both electric and magnetic fields. And we can, uh, uh, in, in our code, the collision terms are the electron phonon collision terms. So this evolution is represented pictorially over here. Uh, imagine you have this gray sphere which represents your set of occupied states without any external disturbances. And that's usually given by the Fermi Dirac distribution. Now we apply external fields that drives the system out of equilibrium and uh, is represented by this blue uh, circle over here. If the external uh, drift terms are small, then we can write the total occupation as the sum of the initial equilibrium distribution, which is the Fermi Dirac distribution, plus some small correction factors, delta F and K. So external fields drive the system out of equilibrium and the electron phonon scattering terms tend to restore this equilibrium distribution. And essentially when these two terms balance each other, that's when we reach a steady state. And that is the electronic occupations that we uh, want to compute. So that uh, under uh, the effects of small perturbations or small fields, 
we can assume that this quantity delta FNK, which represents the changes in electronic occupations, it's small and approximately uh, proportional to the uh, field strength just by linearly expanding this in terms of uh, different orders in the theory. Now, the simplest way to solve the BTE or Boltzmann equation is by using a relaxation time approximation or rather the constant relaxation time approximation. So imagine a system where you have just an electric field, no thermal gradients, no magnetic fields, and you uh, on the left side, uh, you have this drift term that's created by the electric field. And we can make the approximation that the occupation here can be approximately represented by the Fermi Dirac distribution, assuming a small electric field. And on the right time, we can uh, on the right side we can make the assumption that the collision rate is approximately proportional to the change in the uh, occupations. The proportionality constant being one over tau. Tau here is usually uh, uh, physically interpreted as a relaxation time. And in the constant relaxation time approximation, we can solve this equation for this unknown quantity delta F and K. And uh, it, it turns out after we do some simple algebra, we get that delta F and K is uh, uh, directly proportional to the dot product of the electric field and the band velocities. So plug this expression for delta F and K into the current equation, uh, equation for the current density, which is given over here. And again, after some algebra, uh, we can arrive at the expression for the conductivity tensor in terms of the band uh, in terms of the band energies, velocities, and the relaxation time. Again, because this is a constant relaxation time approximation, the tau here is usually uh, treated as a em empirical or a fitting parameter in toy model calculations. But uh, our code allows us to go beyond just the simple relaxation time approximation by uh, assigning it a state dependence. So if we uh, like if we take one step further from the constant relaxation time approximation and uh, instead calculate the state dependent relaxation times, that would naturally give uh, more, ex more accurate expressions uh, for the transport coefficients. So the way we compute these state dependent relaxation times is by taking the inverse of the uh, electron phonon scattering rates for each band index n and electronic momentum k. In terms of many body theory, uh, this scattering rate can be represented in terms of the imaginary part of the electron for not self energy, the diagram for which is shown over here. So if we evaluate the self energy term and compute the scattering rate, we find out that uh, this is the expression for the uh, electron for not scattering rates. And it depends on several factors. First of all, it depends on the electron for not matrix elements which you have been introduced to earlier. And it depends on both the electronic momentum K, uh, the phonon momentum Q. Additionally, there are thermal factors, uh, and here represents the phonon occupations, the F here represents the electronic occupations, and these uh, Dirac delta functions impose the energy conservation uh, rules between each scattering process. So our code per turbo allows us to compute these relaxation times and from, uh, these scattering rates and from them relaxation times. And from that, we can compute the conductivity tensor. Now, uh, in order to physically motivate uh, or, or physically justify the reason behind uh, assigning a state dependence to these relaxation times is by actually computing these values uh, in a real system. So this plot on the left, it's from one of our earlier papers and it shows the relaxation time as a function of carrier energies in gallimard schneider at 300 Kelvin. And as we can see, uh, it is hugely dependent on the energy and momenta, and it spans almost two orders of magnitude. So in cases like these, a constant relaxation time is just not very accurate, and therefore this formalism is the way to go. So uh, Perturbo can help us compute uh, the uh, state-dependent relaxation times, scattering rates, and the conductivity tensors. We can go one step even beyond that and solve the full linearized uh, version of the Boltzmann transport equation. In that case, the algebra is slightly more complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, we can expand our electronic occupations as a uh, Fermi Dirac plus some term that linearly depends on the electric field. And we can ignore the terms that depend uh, 
on uh, higher powers of the electric field. Now here, uh, we further make an answer where we expand this uh, gradient term as a product of two different quantities. Uh, the, thermal, the thermal change in the Fermi Dirac occupations, which is a known quantity. And then additionally, we have this uh, uh, unknown uh, capital F and K, which is what we'll solve for uh, in order to get the final expression for conductivity. So we take this expression for the electronic occupations, we plug that back into the Boltzmann equation. And after some tedious algebra, we arrive at this linearized version with F and K as the unknown quantity. And that's the one that we'll solve for. Now, uh, relaxation time just means ignoring this second term on the right. So just uh, taking F and K is equal to tau and K times V and K. Uh, this term on the right, which represents backscattering, contains this uh, scattering rate between two states, K and K plus Q, by either absorption or emission of this phonon of wave vector Q. And the expression for W is given over here. Physically, it's just the scattering probability for scattering between two different states. So this is the equation that we want to solve for, for the full Boltzmann equation. And the way we do it is by using the iterative approach. So we first start with a simple guess for F and K, which is just the relaxation time approximation. Assume it to be tau times V. And we feed it to the right side of the equation. We evaluate F and K again. We evaluate the conductivity tensor from that value. And then we check if it uh, is within uh, a certain error threshold of the previous iteration. If it is, then we print this value out. So the goal of this iterative approach is to improve the results at each step in the iteration until we reach convergence. And that's how we solve the full Boltzmann equation. So, so far I've only talked about uh, Boltzmann transport equation in electric field and solving for the uh, electrical transport coefficients. But the, the, the formalism to compute thermal transport is uh, very similar to the way we do it for the electric fields, except that in the Boltzmann equation, now we have the drift term due to the thermal gradient instead of the electric field on the left side. And we can again make the ansatz by expanding the changes in the electronic occupations to first order in thermal gradients. So the physical picture for thermal transport is just shown over here, where you expect uh, electrons to move from a region of high temperature to a region of low temperature. So by making this expansion and then plugging it back into the Boltzmann equation, we can arrive at a similar linearized version of the BP for thermal transport. Uh, I label this quantity F tilde instead of F to differentiate it from the uh, quantity in electrical transport. It's almost the same as uh, F, except that now there are some certain additional terms that depend on uh, band energies. Uh, so again, we employ the iterative approach to solve for this F tilde, and from that we can extract thermal transport coefficients such as thermal conductivities or Seebeck uh, coefficients. So to summarize, if we have a system with both finite temperature gradient and a finite electric field, then we can expand this delta F and K to first order in electric field and first order in temperature gradient, solve for these two unknowns F and F tilde. And from that, we can compute the electrical transport properties and thermal transport properties such as Seebeck coefficients and thermal conductivities. So a sample calculation for the case of gallium arsenide is shown in these two plots on the right. We have mobilities versus temperature in both the relaxation time approximation and using the full Boltzmann equation. And uh, the plot on the, the lower plot shows Seebeck coefficients calculated in gallium arsenide at different carrier concentrations versus temperature. So our code is capable of computing uh, both electrical and thermal transport. Now, so far what I've explained, uh, this was already a part of the first version of Perturbo 1.0, but since then we have introduced newer functionalities in version 2.0. Uh, by introducing or by extending the scope of transport. Uh, firstly, we also include magnetic fields now since version 2.0. Uh, we can use the same formalism that we did for the electric field, except now we also need to include the drift terms due to magnetic fields. And if we solve the Boltzmann transport equation, uh, if we try to linearize the BTE, we find that we get an equation that's similar to the equation that we obtained previously 
except now we have a magnetic field dependent term. So you see this V cross V term that comes from the Lorentz force. And additionally, there is this gradient of F and K, which makes things slightly more complicated. So usually we evaluate, uh, well, in our, in our code, we evaluate the gradient using the central finite difference scheme. So the gradient of K, gradient with respect to K of this quantity F and K is just evaluated as a difference between these quantities, uh, difference between the neighbors, weighted by uh, the weight of each neighbor and uh, the vector that connects the neighboring K points. So this is the central finite difference scheme, and that's how you evaluate the derivatives. Uh, and like electrical transport, we use similar iterative approach to solve for this uh, unknown quantity F. The only difference is that now F depends on the magnetic field, and therefore the electrical conductivity also depends on the magnetic field. So then we can extract the full uh, B field dependent conductivity tensor, and from that we can extract uh, more physical quantities such as the Hall mobilities and the Hall factors. Now, uh, as Marco mentioned in his lecture, Hall mobility is the mobility that we actually measure uh, in a Hall effect uh, experiment. And it's normally different from the actual mobility of the system, which I'm calling the drift mobility mu b by this factor r, the Hall factor. And computing magneto transport properties allows you to actually calculate the Hall factor uh, using this expression over here. So we tested this method on uh, silicon, gallium arsenide, and graphene, and uh, got very good results in comparison with experiments. These two plots on the right over here are from the uh, are from our paper uh, on magneto transport. Uh, both plots show Hall mobilities, drift mobilities, and Hall factors for the case of silicon, and we achieve a very good agreement with experiments. So that's one feature that we introduced in version 2.0. Additionally, uh, we have also introduced an interface to take into account enharmonic phonons that are computed using uh, t depth method or temperature dependent effective potential. So uh, the definition of G looks something like this, uh, or the definition of electron phonon uh, depends on the inner product. Uh, of the electronic state K plus Q, this quantity which we call the phonon perturbation potential and the electronic state K. And it's also normalized by uh, this factor that depends on frequency. Uh, this phonon perturbation potential can be further rewritten in this expression and it can be expanded into uh, uh, phonon eigenmodes times uh, the gradient of the self-consistent potential. So what TDEP code or temperature dependent effective potential does is when you have a system with enharmonic phonons, it takes into account the effects of temperature to modify the matrix elements. And we see from this expression that the temperature dependence enters the matrix elements through two in two places. First is through this frequency term, phonon frequency term, and the second is through these phonon eigen displacements term. So that's what we uh, calculate using the uh, T depth code first. Uh, let me explain that formalism a little bit. Uh, what the T depth code essentially does is we can uh, treat or we can approximate any system uh, using the harmonic approximation at any temperatures uh, in, in this manner. So these are the regular kinetic energy terms. And then this one on the right represents uh, the effective uh, force constants which depend on temperature. And these are unknown quantities that the code TDEP allows us to calculate. And the way we do that is we perform a first principles molecular dynamics run at a temperature P. Uh, we collect uh, the displacements uh, of the atoms and the forces, and we try fitting them. Uh, we try fitting these uh, calculated uh, forces and displacements to the uh, harmonic model in order to extract these force constants. Now, once, once we obtain these force constants, we can diagonalize them and obtain the temperature dependent uh, frequencies and eigen displacement. And from that, we can introduce temperature dependencies onto the electron phonon coupling. So uh, one paper of ours uh, 
actually performs these calculations on the prototypical system strontium uh, titanate. And it, uh, where, where you can see that this gray curve, which is the initial DFPD calculation exhibits soft phonons, but uh, TDEP code uh, renormalizes them, the phonon frequencies according to the temperatures, and then we can incorporate those effects into electron phonon matrix as well. So uh, Polterbo version 2.0 and above also helps us, uh, also allows us to compute these uh, temperature dependent electron phonon matrices for enharmonic phonons. So, so far I've only talked about the technical details and the methods and the theory that's used behind all of these calculations. But, uh, uh, sorry, I've only talked about the methods and the theory that we used for these calculations, uh, but haven't talked about the technical details uh, because they are equally important uh, to successfully implement some of these expressions. So let's start with the scattering rate calculations. Uh, this is the expression for the electron phonon scattering rate as I showed earlier. And it has several ingredients that need to be taken into account when numerically computing these terms. First is that uh, it involves a summation over the phonon wave vectors Q. So the choice of the Q points in the Brillouin zone is important. And our code per turbo allows us to sample these Q points uh, either uh, on a regular phonon wave vector mesh in the first Brillouin zone or using a random Monte Carlo sampling such as uniform distribution or some sort of important sampling like Cauchy distribution, which is especially important if you want to uh, successfully converge these quantities in polar systems. Uh, secondly, uh, I would also like to point out that uh, in order to successfully converge the scattering rates, we need a large number of Q samples and Q groups to uh, achieve the uh, converged values. Uh, typically, these values are uh, greater than 10,000 uh, phonon wave vectors Q in the B zone. Uh, also, these Dirac delta functions uh, are usually uh, implemented in our code in the form of Gaussians with finite smearing, uh, the expression for which is shown over here. The eta represents the smearing or the broadening parameter that we use to get these calculations to converge. Another common choice for this uh, Dirac delta functions is a Lorentzian, but as shown in this figure, which is also from one of our papers, um, getting uh, the scattering rates to converge for Lorentzian smearings is much harder uh, than Gaussian smearings. So we typically represent these Dirac delta functions as Gaussians in our code. And there has to be some trade off between the choice between the, the, the Q point samples, the K point samples and the, the smearing parameter in order to successfully get converged values. Uh, before I move on, I, I, I'd also like to point out a useful scheme that our code uses, uh, especially for polar systems. Uh, and because the scattering rates depend on the electron phonon matrix elements, or rather the square of the EPH matrix element, uh, our code is capable of separating these G squared into two parts. One is the long range component and the other one is the remainder. And the reason we do that is because the square of the long range component goes as one over Q squared. So this is a divergent quantity uh, near the phonon wave vector Q is equal to gamma. So it may be better to use uh, important sampling uh, in order to uh, get, uh, in order to converge the long range part. Uh, for example, a Cauchy distribution. On the other hand, the remainder, the, the we subtract uh, the long range, the square of the long range part from the square of the matrix elements. This is a well-behaved quantity and therefore we can use a uniform sampling in order to get it to converge. So by combining uh, two, uh, by combining the scattering rates for uh, the long range part and the remainder and uh, summing them using different samples of Q, we are able to ensure that uh, we get convert scattering rates uh, in the most optimized manner possible without uh, wasting, uh, uh, or, or, or without including a lot of Q points. Uh, this plot on the right here shows the scattering rates versus carrier energies uh, in gallium arsenide 
uh, where we have actually separated the long range and the short uh, and the remainder parts. And clearly, because gallium arsenide is a polar material, the long range part is expected to uh, exhibit uh, more contributions compared to the remainder. So the goal of this is to basically reduce the computational cost by choosing different types of sampling within the same system and enable fast computations of scattering rates on fine grids uh, in the entire Bulon zone. Now that we have uh, the converged values of scattering rates, uh, we can also compute within the relaxation time approximation, the expression for the conductivity tensor. So this is the full expression for the conductivity tensor, but our code splits it into two parts where we represent the conductivity as an energy integral over this thermal factor times something we call the transport distribution function. That's this sigma over here, and it's defined like this. And it's, uh, it involves the summation over the k points. So if you were to take this expression and plug it back into the equation for the conductivity tensor, you would actually recover the expression that we initially started with. But the reason behind this separation is that this uh, physically gives us an intuition as to what energy ranges give a significant contribution to transport as shown in this plot over here. Uh, if we plot this uh, transport distribution function times the thermal factor, we actually know that there's a certain energy window that contributes the most to the conductivity tensor and is therefore physically meaningful. I would also like to point out that we perform this case phase summation using the highly accurate tetrahedron integration. And additionally, because the computation of relaxation time is very expensive, our code also makes use of symmetry arguments in order to just compute the relaxation times on the irreducible wedge of the Brillon zone and then later uh, uh, unfolding it onto the entire Brillon zone using symmetry operations. So to summarize, uh, we use tetrahedron methods uh, for Brillon zone summation. Uh, we use symmetry to reduce the computational costs of the electron phonon scattering rates. And uh, we compute this quantity transport distribution function of TDF that gives us a physically meaningful insight into the energy window that actually contributes to transport. There is uh, another feature that we implement within our code, which is the energy window. Because, uh, and since we know that only certain portion of the energy bands are thermally activated and give a reasonable contribution to the conductivity tensor, uh, we actually impose a finite cutoff and only compute the scattering and the Brillon zone summation over the uh, K points which belong within the energy window. So pictorially, this is shown in this uh, schematic over here. Imagine you have this energy window cut off and you have this whole Brillon zone. We only compute transport or we only do the summation for the points within this window. So uh, for, for physical insight into the, uh, the computational reduction that we obtain using this process, uh, we can see that for a 100 cube grid for gallium arsenide, the number of irreducible K points or the number of symmetry reduced K points reduces from 44,000 to just 30 points if we impose this energy window cutoff. Because only these 30 points are the ones that actually contribute to transport. Similarly, if we look at the total number of K points because it's 100 cube grid, it reduces from a million points to just 300, a little above 300 points. And also the same for tetrahedra. So uh, the goal behind these tetrahedron integration uh, uh, symmetry unfolding, uh, energy window restrictions, uh, transport distribution function. It's to ensure that our code can compute uh, these transport coefficients in the most optimal manner possible without losing accuracy. Uh, now, what I've explained so far was transport within the relaxation time approximation. We also need, uh, in order to solve the full Boltzmann equation, which it looks like this. We have this extra term that uh, requires uh, storage of these individual scattering channels, uh, which is which makes things more complicated than just for a simple relaxation time approximation. So for starters, uh, we only store the scattering channels that satisfy energy and momentum conservation because those are the only ones that will survive after the imposition of the uh, uh, Dirac delta functions. 
This is efficient, but it still requires a large memory space. So in order to do that, we now uh, impose or we, we distribute these scattering channels uh, uh, using a hybrid open MP and MPI parallelization. So what we do is we find all of the KQ pairs that are relevant to our transport calculation, and we distribute them using MPI parallelization on different processes. Then on each process, we compute these electron phonon matrix elements, we compute this scattering channel W, and we compute this summation just within that process. And we even uh, parallelize it further by using open MP within each process to compute this uh, sum. Uh, after we compute these sums, we later collect the contributions from all the processes to get the final integral. So we distribute these KQ pairs among all the computing nodes. We compute, store, and operate these scattering objects WKQ uh, on the for, for on, on just the local process. And we essentially only uh, uh, retain and store the uh, KQ pairs where the scattering rates are larger than a, thresh, a certain threshold. So again, the goal of this is to ensure that uh, we are able to compute transport coefficients in the most efficient manner uh, with a significantly reduced computational cost. Now, as I had explained for the relaxation time approximation, we also impose this energy window for the full uh, of the full Boltzmann equation. And uh, therefore, we only consider the KQ pairs which fall within this energy window. So again, pictorially, this is represented in this scheme over here, where if this is the energy window cutoff, we only consider the KQ pairs where both K and K plus Q lie within the window. If both K and K plus Q are outside the window, or even if one of them is outside the window, we don't count them. So that way we are able to get a significant reduction in the total number of KQ pairs that we need. So for example, for a 50 cube grid in gallium arsenide, it's roughly around uh, 18 million points if we don't impose this energy window cutoff. But once we impose that, it reduces to a mere 2000. So that way we are able to get a huge, significant reduction in computational cost. So again, the goal of all of this is to ensure that we are able to compute transport coefficients in the most optimal manner possible. Uh, for future releases, we are planning on extending transport just beyond the semi-classical Boltzmann equation by including Polaron transport using the cumulant dance arts. Uh, we also plan on combining Berry curvature with the Boltzmann equation at certain point. Uh, as Marco mentioned earlier, we will also interface our code with uh, the stochastic self-consistent self harmonic approximation or the SHA code for enharmonic phonons. And we also plan on including more scattering mechanisms in, the, uh, in our formalism in the future, uh, particularly electron-electron scattering. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk and I'd be happy to take any questions.